This is it. You'll get rid of me after this lecture. Um, for those of you who have just joined, my name is Mike Allison. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I've trained in emergency internal medicine and critical care. And I have a particular interest in the use of ultrasound in, in cardiac arrest. So imagine you're going into the ICU, your next shift. You're walking in, you're turning the corner. First thing you see on the monitor is the rhythm. You hear a bustle of activity, and then you hear that noise. It's not playing, but you know that noise of asystole. The first thing you're going to do is get your team mobilized and put things onto the patient's chest, rhythm analysis, start compressions. But when we're monitoring our patients in cardiac arrest, our standard has been to take our fingers, put them on a peripheral part of the, the patient, maybe central, and try and see if we can tactilely feel a pulse. What if there was a maneuver we can do, easily accessible at the bedside, to see inside the heart, inside the chest, and see what is actually going on. If only such a technology existed, maybe that could help us during our cardiac arrests. So you had a nice introduction to echocardiography, and here are some emergency images that you're seeing of patients in cardiac arrest. You're noticing that some of them, you're just noticing a little bit of swirling of blood in the ventricle. Others are having a little bit of contraction of that left ventricle. Maybe bradycardic, but they're contracting. Others you're seeing very little at all. And one you're seeing some flickering of a valve. So these are all patients with no pulse, but the images are very different. And maybe you're seeing some dilatation of the right ventricle in one of them as well. So how can we use echocardiography and ultrasound to inform our decisions in, in cardiac arrest. I think this is going to be a revolution, and I think this is going to change practice, potentially. And I think this is a, a, a very important topic to talk about. But we have a roadmap. We'll talk a little bit about an overview. And in 20 minutes, I don't think I can get through everything involving ultrasound and, and cardiac arrest. But I want to provide a, a basic overview that allows you the information you desire to go and read more on the topic. But I want to talk about two parts of cardiac ultrasound in arrest that have new data, and both are not yet published, to inform our decisions about whether we can stop CPR based upon what we see on ultrasound, or any adverse effects of using, and in particular adverse effect of using ultrasound in cardiac arrest. So here we are in our resuscitation room. By overview, we had come in, we see that shockable rhythm put that probe away, right? Because we know that what's going to best benefit this patient is great compressions, early cardioversion, cooling, and potentially catheterization, the four Cs. We don't need ultrasound in this algorithm, at least not right away. This is time sensitive. You want electricity, not sonography. But the patient with PEA arrests that we're seeing often, especially our in-hospital arrests, are complicated. And I think ultrasound may help. Our traditional teaching has been to go through a litany of H's and T's that uh, some may even exist and cause cardiac arrest, and some may not even often cause our cardiac arrest. But we go through this mental exercise nearly every time we're seeing our patients with PEA arrest. And can echo help inform our decisions in patients with hypovolemia or hemorrhage? pericardial tamponade, tension pneumothorax, myocardial or pulmonary arterial thrombosis? I think so. So here we see another example, you've seen a couple already today, of pericardial tamponade, right ventricular dysfunction. And if you saw this in cardiac arrest, if you saw some fluid around the heart in cardiac arrest, you change your decisions instantly. Possibly somewhat more complicated is if you get this apical view of the heart 
and you see that RV dilatation, that RV that's supposed to be 60% of the LV, that RV looks way bigger than the LV in this picture, greater than one. In the patient presenting in cardiac arrest, are we thinking pulmonary embolism, systemic thrombolysis, maybe ECMO? And then taking ultrasound in our patients in arrest and looking at, the, looking at the chest, looking between the ribs, we're seeing that bright white pleural line. On the left-hand side, you're seeing some shimmering. You see that white line? It's the pleural line. It's shimmering. You see some movement. And by performing a contralateral exam on the right side, you notice that there's some difference. There's no movement there. There's some artifacts. And as you advance in your ultrasound use, you can know that this, in a cardiac arrest patient, makes me way more comfortable putting in a right-sided chest tube to decompress the chest. But it's not perfect. It's not perfect because I showed you some perfect images, and that's not when cardiac compressions are taking place. You have to pause compressions in order to get a view of the heart. So you still have to do pauses and compressions unless we're moving on to TEE which would be another topic in and of itself. So can you make assessments of the heart while those compressions are there? I think it's pretty limited. Algorithms have been developed. There's a variety of them that have been put forth in, in the literature to try and help us use ultrasound in an algorithmic fashion to determine what's going on with these patients. Knowing exactly the steps is not important, but knowing that you're using focused ultrasound of the heart and focused ultrasound of the lungs, and then not in this view, focused ultrasound of the veins can potentially inform our decisions. Another complicated algorithm, slightly different. Just know that these protocols exist, but none have yet, yet been validated. So I think we're in the early phase. I think we're in the phase where we're starting to ad adopt this technology and trying to understand where it's going to take us. But there are things that we do know. I think there are things that we do know, and I want to talk about stopping the resuscitation. If you look at ultrasound and cardiac arrest literature for the past uh, 10 to 15 years, this is the topic that has been most published. And it started out in 2001 with this article in Academic Emergency Medicine that was pretty telling when 169 patients were, had point of care ultrasound and cardiac arrest, 136 had cardiac standstill, and of those 136, none survived. That's an amazing difference in the utilization of resources if this could be replicated, right? Uh, if we can just look and know that this person is not going to have ROSC, we're done. We can see our next patient. We're not going to waste our resources. In the same journal, that same exact journal that year, some investigators looked at the combination of ultrasound plus capnography and just speaking of the ultrasound portion, 102 patients, 61 without activity, 3% survived. Not zero, but low. Take us to the year 2010. So there's a couple studies in between, but take us to 2010, 100 cardiac arrest patients, 34 had no visible cardiac activity, 11% survived. So you see we've gone from zero to 3, to 11. And of course, when you have studies like that with a variety of different patients, uh, uh, the logical next step to get your next publication is to do a meta-analysis and systematic review of the, of the literature. So they pooled all these studies together and found that there were about 568 patients uh, that were included in studies with higher quality of ev evidence, and they performed a meta-analysis. 2.4% of these patients with no discernible ultrasound activity had return to spontaneous circulation. But before it being included in that study, published in the same year, so not included in that meta-analysis, is this assessment of ultrasonography and predicting outcome that showed a 45% chance of getting ROSC, even with no discernible cardiac activity. 
And I put in parentheses, I think the crucial piece of information that we want to know is what is survival, what is rough? This was 20 minutes. Does that inform decisions? Is it survivable to, survival to ICU admission, to hospital discharge? What about neurological and functional outcomes? We don't have that data. But a group came together, the Reason Group, Real-Time Emergency Assessment with Sonography Outcome Research Network, and they decided their first study was going to be on the standstill cardiac imaging in cardiac arrest. Multi-center trial in North America. This is not yet published, but if you go on to Twitter and the blogs, the investigators are talking about the results because they're interesting. Uh, so this will be coming out soon. They looked at survival to hospital discharge. So that's a unifying survival to hospital discharge. And they were able to include a large number, a total of 800 patients that got ultrasound during their cardiac arrest. If you had cardiac activity, 2.7% survived to hospital discharge. If you had no cardiac activity, still 1%. Uh, uh, five minutes. Thank you. So I'm not sure we're ready to stop that resuscitation just yet. People are still surviving the hospital discharge. The absolute difference is only 1.7. Are we going to stop our resuscitation in all patients and miss out on that 1%? I'm not sure if we have the answer just from ultrasound. I think we have to keep other aspects of our resuscitation in mind patient characteristics, the same selection that was talked about with eCPR. Uh, the 89-year-old woman coming in who has a history of coronary disease and has cardiac standstill, you're going to make one decision if you see standstill. The 45-year-old marathoner who collapses one kilometer prior to the finish line, you're probably going to make a different decision with that patient in standstill. My last topic is I want to talk about the pitfalls of use of ultrasound in cardiac arrest. We know it's important. We know compressions are important. And we've known that since you know, the early 2000s, that compressions and chest compression fraction determine survival in these patients. So it seems like a day where we like to put on videos from the office. But this is the staying alive tune. And you see Michael Scott was doing some good compressions, but I think he got distracted. So they don't know what's important. They weren't focusing on the compressions, but we know what's important and we want to focus on compressions. So when we get cardiac arrests into the emergency department, I mean, our residents are running over with the ultrasound now and they're using it as a pulse check nearly. They're using it every single time we're taking hands off. And I noticed that these checks were longer and longer and longer. Because you're not seeing anything, again, during compressions. You'll only potentially see something and be able to interpret the image once you stop that cardiac compression. And how long does it take you to interpret that image, make a decision, decide what you're going to do? How long does it take you to acquire that image? So I got our medical director of the emergency department to install some cameras. We did some videotape, uh, we videotaped all the resuscitations that we were doing. And we looked at the pause in chest compressions. We looked at, yes, was ultrasound used? If you used ultrasound during the chest compression, during the pause in chest compressions, what was the time of the pulse check? 21.6 seconds. What if you didn't use ultrasound? 13.1 seconds. So again, not adhered to the guidelines, but you see that difference. So I want to tell you that this is limited. This is, this is a pilot study because we wanted to first establish whether it was worth looking at in only 14 patients. We've now increased the number to 25 patients. We did have some significant difference statistically, and we'll continue to analyze this data, and hopefully this will be something that will make it into the, the literature to inform our practice.
because getting a view of the heart before you stop the compressions, maybe that can decrease time. So maybe we shouldn't just stop ultrasonography and cardiac arrest altogether, but if we can see the heart moving, we can shorten the time that we have hands off by getting that image earlier and quicker, making quick interpretations. And if we're cognizant of the fact that we're making longer decisions uh, and we're taking a longer amount of time when we use ultrasound, we can potentially improve that behavior, having somebody check that behavior for us. So I only have two take home points for you. I don't think echo results are the sole reason to stop CPR. You still need to use your brain, not just the ultrasound machine. That's good for us, good for the brains. An echo during CPR may adversely lengthen the pulse check duration. And I think we're getting some preliminary data on this. And I think it's worth looking into more because we know that the chest compression fraction is really important. We know we need to do good quality CPR. And if ultrasound is going to interrupt that, for the few patients it benefits with the pericardial effusion, the PE, For those few patients that is potentially benefit, it may be hurting the ma vast majority of patients that we're trying to do good CPR on. So thanks for your attention. I'll take some questions at the break.